Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. We're James. James, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Okay. Well, basically, um, you know, I served as a uh, political science professor for the last 20 years. I was a department chair up at the uh, college that I worked at in Valencia, California. And uh, basically... Uh, Decided to write a book on the Kennedy assassination and uh, spent about seven years doing that. What do you uh, write about when it comes to the Kennedy assassination? It seems like every researcher I talk to has a specific focus. Well, one of the things that I did, if you look at a lot of the books that are written on the assassination, the various authors will hone in on one particular point. And in some cases, they'll use a lot of anecdotal information to fill in the concept that they're trying to get across. And what I wanted to do was to do a very organized uh, presentation of the data. In other words, what I wanted to do is amalgamate all the data that was out there on various topics involved in the assassination itself. and. Um, if you go back to uh, one of the very first books that did this, Josiah Thompson's book, Six Seconds in Dallas, he did an excellent empirical approach to the Kennedy assassination. And that's what I wanted to follow as well. So to give you an example, you know, people talked about Jack Ruby being a violent guy. So I broke down all the assaults that Ruby was involved in by whether he did it to his customers, whether he did it to his workers, whether he had additional areas where he exercised the use of violence. So I broke it all down. And um, as an example, I went through the uh, 295 witness statements of all the people that were in Dealey Plaza, and I codified all of the information into charts where they were standing. So as an example, we broke the replies into two groups. People either said they heard a shot from the knoll or they heard a shot from the Texas School Book Depository. That broke down into two categories. People said it definitely came from the knoll or it came from the knoll area or it definitely came from the Texas School Book Depository or it came from the Texas School Book Depository area. So by location, I put all of these people at the charts so we could take a look at where the witnesses actually said the shots came from. And so the interesting part about that is it begins to show you some interesting, you might say, patterns in the, in the uh, data. And so as an example, I just want to switch to uh, those particular charts. So as an example, if you look at the witnesses who said shots came from the knoll, you had a total of 64 people who said shots came from the knoll or the knoll area. When you look at the shots coming from the Texas School Book Depository, it turns out to be 62 people. So it's almost exactly the same. 64 for the knoll, 62 for the Texas School Book Depository. And what this helps us to do is to understand some of the things that the Warren Commission told us. So as an example, when you read the Warren Commission report, one of the first things you will see in the report is it states clearly there is no evidence of a shot from any other location other than the Texas School Book Depository. Well, the data blows that out of the water. You got 64 witnesses clearly testifying it came from the 
Noel area or the Noel itself. And these were people who never changed their testimony. You have to keep in mind that these witnesses testified before the Warren Commission months after the assassination. They were bombarded in the media that there was only one shooter. They were bombarded in the media with the fact that, as the Warren Commission called the fact, that only shots came from the Texas School Book Depository. The FBI said the shots came from the Texas School Book Depository. The Dallas police said the shots came from the Texas School Book Depository. But none of these people changed their testimony. Every one of them stuck with what they originally said. The shots came from the grassy knoll. So this is what I attempted to do throughout the entire book. You know, summarize the data on each one of these particular issues. So as an example, in the back of the book as well, I have appendices. Not only are the witnesses who said the shots came from the knoll and those who said the shots that came from the Texas School Book Depository listed, so people can go and uh, listen to their testimony or watch their testimony. But we also have some additional information. The number of people who said they saw smoke come from the knoll. Number of people who said they heard different gunfire sounds. So all of these things are important. They all indicate one of the first things that the Warren Commission said there was no credible evidence of a shot anywhere from anywhere else other than the Texas School Book Depository. The facts just don't bear that out. So that was the approach that I took. It's it's an issue that the Warren Commission is what the history books are told by. But then you get to the point of when you look at the Warren Commission only had one suspect and that suspect was Oswald. So, of course, it only they were only going to look at the book depository building. But then you got smoke coming from the knoll where there's allegedly a second shooter. I believe in a second shooter. I believe that there was two shots. I believe what the witnesses said that Kennedy was caught in a crossfire. There's a Secret Service guy up there flashing a badge. What What is that? And apparently he wasn't Secret Service. So you get into this aspect of a lot of weird stuff is going on. And it seems like I think even the Parkland medical doctors were eventually shown the Zapruder film um, after they made their official thing where they changed their autopsy findings. Where you get to this point of like, okay, so where's the truth at then? It's hard to instill into the public the idea of conspiracy. Or You, you have to start. You have to look at the Warren Commission in this particular way. You've got to start out thinking about the Warren Commission advancing a hypothesis on how this crime went down. And like every hypothesis that's put out there for scientific review, over time, anomalies begin to accumulate. And one of the things that you find is that the Warren Commission report you know, if you read the first, it's about seven to 800 pages, the, ori the original report that they issued. It's but great. Once you paper. Start to, yeah. But once you start to dig in to the 26 volumes, and I read the 26 volumes twice. OK, so when you start going through that, the anomalies begin to accumulate. And once anomalies begin to accumulate to the point where the hypothesis or the theory can no longer explain them, the theory totally breaks down. And that's exactly what happened with the Warren Commission report. And the very first one is what I just mentioned. You know, no credible evidence of a shot from any other place, but we've got plenty of evidence of that. But then you can go to the next step. Well, Jack Ruby was just this local uh, club owner and he was upset by the fact that um, President Kennedy was murdered well, you know, if you start to take a look at Ruby and uh, Dr. David Shine did, a, Shine did a very good book on his contract on America, the numerous contacts that Ruby had with organized criminals was absolutely astounding. He was calling people major criminals at home. Now, it would be like I just came on to your show and I'm sure you watch The Sopranos on occasion. And uh, if I said to you, and let's assume Tony Soprano was a real mafia don, and I said to you, oh, uh, by the way, I called Tony Soprano last night at home, you'd be saying, what? You called Tony Soprano at home? You've got that kind of a contact? 
Jack Ruby was calling major criminals associated with Hoffa, Giancana, Sam, uh, I should say Sam Giancana, Carlos Marcello, and Santos Traficante. He was calling all of these people at home. He was well connected. And to dismiss the fact that the mafia in some way, shape, or form could have been involved in this assassination was the second anomaly that starts to blow the Warren Commission report out of the water. And then we can go on to the next one. Oswald was a loner. Well, you know, that works very well for the Warren Commission. You know, it's kind of like this lone wolf type of situation today. You know, if you got a lone wolf who carries out a terrorist attack, well, he doesn't have any connections. It was just this one person. That's how they were trying to portray Oswald. But if you study Oswald, you're going to find that this guy had a huge number of contacts that were never fully investigated. So let me give you one quick example. I'm sure you've seen the films of Oswald handing out leaflets in front of the Trade Center in uh, New Orleans. Fair play for Cuba Committee. Right. And basically, he was with a guy that he hired. I believe the, one of the Amer he hired an American. The guy's name was Steele. And the Warren Commission was able to question him and find out that Oswald just paid him a few bucks to do this. But there was also a Cuban guy or a Latino looking person, along with Oswald handing out those leaflets. The FBI never located this guy. They don't know who he was. And as an example in the book, you know, as I say that I, I wanted to amalgamate and put all of this data together, I have a section called the Latino factor. Oswald was seen with a number of Latinos who were never found by the FBI, never questioned by the FBI. And so the guy in the in the in the photograph in the film the, with Oswald handing out the leaflets was one case. And you know, if you remember his attorney in New Orleans, Dean Andrews, mm -hmm. he also stated that Oswald showed up at a couple of meetings with him with a number of Latinos. Those people were never located either. Okay, you got the audio, the Sylvia Odio testimony that he showed up at her apartment in Dallas with two guys, one of whom was a Latino. And so uh, they never really located those folks either. And then there was an, another interesting situation, just talking about people that showed up with Oswald. There was a barber out in the Oak Cliff area of, uh, or, or actually uh, Irving, uh, by the name of Clifton Shastin. Is he the same guy that saw Oswald with a small child? Right. That was another situation. Never located the trial. And the F and, and when Shastine told the uh, FBI that he saw Oswald driving a car, the FBI's reply was, oh, he didn't drive. He didn't have a driver's license. OK, but he was not the only one to say that. But the key point was a lot of these people were never fully investigated. They were never found. So to, for the Warren Commission to make that claim that he was a loner, just doesn't work out. As a matter of fact, even when he was down in Mexico City, he met with a number of people in Mexico City that the Warren Commission either didn't know about or never fully investigated, and neither did the FBI. When you move on to the Tippett killing, here's the next anomaly. You know that uh, Oswald, well, I do personally believe that Oswald shot Tippett. I do believe it, okay? The problem that I have with it is this. If you look at the evidence, Tippett pulls up to Oswald in a, in, a, in a residential area, two miles away, several miles away, actually, from the Texas School Book Depository. Why in the world would Tippett be looking for the president's assassin in a residential neighborhood? You know, the cops would be at the bus stations, the airport places where people would be trying to flee the city, not in a residential area, but Tippett is out there. And one of the interesting things about this is, is that when Oswald returns to his rooming house, 
Earlene Roberts, the woman who oversaw the rooming house, she stated that when Oswald came in, a Dallas police car drove up outside the house and, and blew the horn twice and then left. Now, what's even more interesting about that is that this really upset the Warren Commission, that a Dallas police car drove up outside the house when Oswald was there. So they had the FBI check it out. And the FBI issued a, uh, a document where they checked every vehicle in operation that day of the assassination. And they found large numbers of vehicles were at the Trade Center. Large numbers were still down in Dealey Plaza. Large numbers were um, in various other locations at the airport and so on, guarding um, uh, Air Force One. And they found that there were a few cars that could have been in the Oak Cliff area near Earlene Roberts, the rooming house where Oswald was staying. So they investigated every car and they found nobody actually stopped at the rooming house. Now, the only, you know, the most interesting thing about the FBI report, they checked every vehicle, every vehicle that was in use that day is mentioned in the FBI report, except one. Do you know what vehicle that is? The one Tippett was driving. Why did the FBI leave that out of the report? That's a very interesting question. And so basically, I personally believe that Tippett was recruited to aid Oswald in some way. I don't think Tippett was in on the assassination at all. I think he was doing a favor for somebody, maybe, maybe through Ruby. And that basically he was there maybe to provide transit or transportation somewhere for Oswald, maybe to this airport that was nearby, Red Bird Airport, I believe it was. And um, I think that what may have happened is that Tippett listening to the police radio, by the time he picked up Oswald, which was after one o'clock, he would have a pretty good idea that Kennedy was shot, probably dead. And he might have started to ask himself, what am I getting myself into here? And so when he rolls up next to Oswald, he talks to Oswald through the vent window of the car. You know, years ago, they used to have those little vent windows mm -hmm. that you could open. The window on the driver's side was all the way up. He talks to Oswald through the vent window. Who would talk to a potential killer through the vent window? Now, I interviewed a number of police officers, and I asked them, would you make this kind of a stop? Every single one of them said Tippett either had to be totally incompetent or crazy to make this kind of a stop. So when he gets out of the car, Oswald knows the game is up. So he shoots Tippett three times. He starts to run away, comes back, and shoots Tippett in the head. There is a connection between these two guys. And Oswald wanted to make sure Tippett wasn't alive and able to identify him. So I think there was a connection there. And I think if you look at Tippett's behavior during this entire time, it's very odd. You know, breaking into the top 10 store, you know, and stopping other people uh, in, in the Oak Cliff area. And so you might want to ask the question, how could Tippett be linked to Jack Ruby? Well, if you look at the, the information, you will find out that Ruby knew Tippett's supervisor, Sergeant Calvin Owens, for 10 years. He also knew the sister of Earlene Roberts, Bertha Cheek. Bertha Cheek was a real estate agent in Dallas, Texas. And she met with Ruby the week before the assassination. She claimed he was trying to get her to open up another club. So Ruby could have known about Oswald's stay at the rooming house, could have had information on where Tippett was going to be stationed. The whole, he could have been 
in a situation to ask Tippett to do him a favor and give Oswald a ride. That's why he showed up at the rooming house. Except the connection went wrong. And the next thing, Oswald is out on the street. And the interesting thing about it, I went to Dallas. I checked a lot of these locations. And I drove through that neighborhood. And I went to the spot where uh, Tippett was killed. Oz, Ruby's apartment, I was astonished to find this out, was three-tenths of a mile away from the direction that Oswald was walking in. So when you add all of this up, there are a lot of connections between these guys. They shopped in the same, Ruby and um, Oswald shopped in the same stores, the same delicatessen. Tippin, Ruby, and Oswald all went to the top 10 record store. Uh, they were all in the same area. Ruby knows Earlene Roberts' sister. So there are all these connections that unfortunately were never fully checked out. But when you look at that, it becomes another anomaly in this whole situation. There was likely some type of connection between Oswald and Ruby. And of course, we know a couple of days before the assassination, Oswald and Tippett were eating in the same little cafe, the Dobbs House Cafe, a couple of blocks from his rooming house. And we also know Jack Ruby used to go into that Dobbs house when he's add up. And one of the things that you've got to think about is they've never been fully checked out. The investigation, we can only wonder about these things today because we don't have the, we don't have the data. The investigation was, was flawed. It never followed up a lot of these leads. So as I go on and I started to take a look at this further, you have to go back and take a look at some, some other things the Warren Commission said. Well, Gerald Ford, as an example, made the statement, we knew the witnesses like our own family. I don't know if you ran across that quote from Ford, but knew the witnesses like our own family? Really? Let me... Uh, How many me... witnesses suspiciously died? That's the real question. Well, let's take a look at it even, even further than that for just a moment. Nobody even mentioned Jack Ruby's connection in Cuba with gun running, and nobody even brought that up. But the Warren Commission, they have Jack, they have Jack Ruby's mother's dental records in there. They have a fake statement that the House Select Committee on Assassinations proved to be false, which was the, a thing his lawyer made up um, during his court case, saying that, oh, his heart goes out to Jackie Kennedy and she's welcome anytime at his club. And hell, apparently the Dallas police, even though they knew Jack Ruby pretty well, none of them ever went to his club. So it's like, I, I don't know with Oswald because Oswald, like I said, his personality is hard for me to be able to narrow it down. I know he has intelligence blueprints. He definitely but is. He has, he has intelligence blueprints, but then, you know, you got the loan. He, he just seemed like he was a quirky guy from what I've heard. I've looked at the archives of Malcolm Blunt. I trust that research 100%, even the papers of Harold Weisberg. And it seems like some of those witnesses and some of the painted a description of Oswald in a sense where you get a person that doesn't seem like it would be hanging out at Jack Ruby's club. But then I bring up the question to you. When we talk about that diner incident, how do we know if someone's not using Lee Harvey Oswald's name by saying, hey, I'm Lee Harvey? Because then you have the guy at the firing range who was apparently shooting other people's targets saying, this is what I'm going to do to the president. And it's use the name Lee Harvey. That's not real, though. Oswald never went to a gun range, but they have a record saying that Oswald, some person using his name, was talking about killing the president at a gun range. Well, you even have the guy Bogard talking about him coming in, trying to buy a car and drove the car like a nut. Right? Yeah, no, that, that's the yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald. He doesn't have a Maybe driver's I license. Go back to Russia if I can't buy the car, <laughs> right? So, uh, but I want to go back to one thing because I think this is important. Ford's statement, because what it goes to is the veracity of the Warren Commission. Now, Ford makes this statement, we knew the witnesses like our own family, okay? Well, thanks to Dr. Wall Brown, we've got some information on this. And let, let me just give you a couple of numbers here. The Warren Commission interviewed 488 witnesses, 488. 
only 93 of those witnesses appeared before the Warren Commission. The other 395 witnesses, Warren Commission attorneys took statements from. So we knew that the we knew the witnesses like our own family. Well, it was only 93 that you actually interviewed before the Warren Commission. But let's let's go a little step further. The Warren Commission met 93 times. Gerald Ford attended 70 meetings. Alan Dulles attended 60. John Sherman Cooper attended 50. John McCloy attended 35. Boggs attended 20. Senator Russell only attended six. Earl Warren attended all 93 meetings, but he wasn't there for the full 93 meetings. He would either come late or leave early. So that Wolf Brown came to this conclusion. No witness testified before all seven members of the commission, nor were all seven ever present at one time during the testimony of any witness. So we knew the witnesses like our own family. These guys missed most of the meetings. Weren't Russell and Boggs the two dissenters on the Warren Commission that didn't like the way it was going? Well, basically, uh, Cooper and Boggs stated that they did not believe the single bullet theory. And if you don't believe the single bullet theory, you can't support the Warren Commission conclusions. OK, and then you have Senator Russell, who came out later on and totally. Just turned his back on the Warren Commission conclusions, he completely denied the conclusions that they had. So you have a lot of dissension within the Warren Commission itself. And so, um, but I wanted to go back to this point because the Warren Commission made it sound like they did this perfect job. But the fact of the matter is that they didn't. And then as an example, when you go further, uh, the Warren Commission didn't know about the mafia threats on Kennedy's life. They didn't know that Carlos Marcello made a direct threat on Kennedy's life. They didn't know that Santos Traficante made a direct threat on um, uh, Kennedy's life. Those threats were made in September 1962. The Warren Commission is meeting in 64. The Warren Commission doesn't know about the CIA mafia plots. So they had no idea, was it possible that, as an example, Castro attempted to kill Kennedy uh, as a uh, retaliation for attempts on his life? They didn't know about that either. And as a matter of fact, when most of these people, like uh, Bert Griffin, testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, every one of them said, if we had known about the mafia plots to kill Castro, we would have conducted a totally different investigation. Well, you got to keep in mind, who was a member of the Warren Commission? Alan Dulles. Did he know about the CIA attempts to kill Castro? He sure did. How come he didn't inform the commission? Uh, he knew a lot of stuff that he didn't disclose to the Warren Commission. He knew about, first of all, he knew about MK Ultra. And if you look at the therapist or the psychiatrist for Jack Ruby was Joyon West, who's tied in. And you, I look, I boil it. I'm with you. Me and Dave Talbot, we, we believe it's Alan Dulles. But then I start getting into this thing where there is this act of plausible deniability. And you start looking at rogue individuals involved into this. I believe it was the military industrial complex, but I've had some friends who do a, another JFK podcast and they enlightened, to, they enlightened me to the fact of imagine if it's just individual actors and the military industrial complex, why we're getting such notes of them and all of our records. And we're thinking it's Alan Dulles or these people is because these people were the main factors in the cover up. They were the ones that were supplying it. And that's why we're getting notes of them. I think I, honestly, if you asked who killed Kennedy for me, if I said the military industrial complex, I would blame the military industrial complex, not just individual actors. Cause I believe as an organization, you take fault for the issues in the people that are in your command. And whether you want to say rogue actors or whatever, I think you have to look at all these factors. I mean, the Warren Commission was thorough. I give them that. But it was thorough in every aspect. It shouldn't have been thorough. It was talking to a sister's cousin from Texas or Guadalajara. Like, it's way out there. Where it's like, why are you interviewing that person? Why don't you talk to this person? And Barry Ernst is the best example. He wrote a book called The Girl on the Stairs. There were more than one 
girl on the stairs and they only chose to interview one. And the fact that the media fell in line with it, I always bring up the aspect of trial by media. And that's what Oswald was experiencing. Now you're influencing the truth because every media establishment not only is saying it's Oswald, but they're adding things and they're put, putting up photos. I mean, the backyard photograph. I don't call that evidence. You have the fair play for Cuba papers. I don't even care. We're not even going to talk about the argument of it if it's altered. What I go is if you take a picture with a beer in your hand, do I assume you drove home? No, I can't make that conclusion at all. I can't do anything with that. So you can't use that photo and say that Oswald killed the president on the basis of all three things are incriminating him. Now, it's definitely curious. You should definitely look into it, but it's, I, I wouldn't call that sufficient evidence. Well, I would agree with you. I think I think I, I'm not so sure that they did a thorough job. I think that what they did was a. Um, if you if you once you go through the report. What consistently came up to me. Was that they any time there was any threat that if there was a conspiracy to kill the president, they cut it off. OK, so as an example, if you were to look at the uh, situation with Ruby going in, getting in through the basement and killing Oswald in the basement that day. Well, you know, the Warren Commission had tons of information that, and this is another thing that I um, assimilated, put it, put it all together, amalgamated, I should say, in, in, uh, in, in the book. They had tons of people testifying as an example that Ruby, when he entered the basement, had been trying to get into this basement for days in advance, not days in advance, but several, uh, I should say several, two days before the assassination, but that Friday night and that Saturday and Sunday, he was stalking Ruby Oswald. was stalking Oswald. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. As an example, if you go back to Friday night, there are seven witnesses that Oswald was, not excuse me, that Ruby was attempting to get close to Oswald on Friday night. Two of them were Dallas police officers who personally knew Ruby. Okay? Eberhard and uh, Standeeper. Then on Saturday, there was an additional, let me see, uh, approximately Eight people had testified that Ruby was all over Dallas at every location where Oswald might have been transferred at that time, trying to get information. He was even standing outside uh, the sheriff's office in the late afternoon where he was, uh, where, where he ran into uh, James Cheney, one of the motorcycle uh, police officers in the motorcade who was out there on duty and told Ruby to get out of there. He was at the goddamn midnight conference that they had, and he corrected somebody on the fair play for Cuba paper. How did he know that? He corrects Henry Wade. He tells Henry Wade, the district attorney, no, Henry, it's the fair play for Cuba committee. How did he know that? I'll give you the best response I've ever gotten on that. It's all a coincidence. That's, that's, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything, that, that's what I'm saying. So in other words, when you look at the Warren Commission, they ignore the fact that he, you know, look, there was a detective on Saturday, Charles Brown, and he was in the, the building when when when, uh, when Oswald was was being held there. And on Saturday afternoon, he said he witnessed Ruby going downstairs into the basement in the Dallas police headquarters. He saw him going down there Saturday afternoon. Now, he must have been trying to figure a way into the basement. So one of the other things I did, you mentioned something a little bit earlier. How many, uh, how many police actually knew Jack Ruby? Well, the main guy who was holding Oswald after Oswald was killed, he goes, Jack, you son of a bitch. I go, he's on a first name basis with that guy. <laughs> they will, they, listen, I went to, they, you know, they interviewed a, a great many Dallas police officers in the Warren Commission report, the FBI. Those reports are in there. And one of the questions that always came up was, did you know Jack Ruby? So I, I put all of that data together. And as it turns out, from those reports alone, Ruby knew 82 Dallas police officers. 
And that's just, a, that, that number is far less than what he probably actually knew. But let me give you a breakdown. He knew one chief, three captains, seven lieutenants, eight sergeants, 30 detectives, 27 patrolmen. Okay. Now, the, what's even more interesting is that on the morning that he shot Oswald, Sunday morning, there were 59 Dallas police and reserve officers in the basement. Jack Ruby knew 34 of them. That was a total of 58% of the people in the basement Jack Ruby knew. You don't think he might have been in a position to get help? to get into that basement, knowing that many cops. So all of that data is there. So when you, when you start to, you know, when you ask these questions and then you've got the data and the data says, hey, look, he knew, uh, he knew 58% of the people in the basement that were working for the Dallas Police Department. Those are incredible numbers. And they add credence to the fact that there was a conspiracy. Do you think that it was Dallas police that aided in the cover up or the, I guess, killing of Oswald? Because, I mean, if you look at Dallas police, a lot of those members were openly KKK members. I mean, Dallas at that time, at least the police force was very corrupt with gangs and a bunch of stuff that was going on. I mean, during the interrogation, for instance, they didn't write any notes down. I mean, we, I think we got notes from. Uh, I want to say Hosty or it's either Hosty or Fritz. Someone wrote notes in that interrogation uh during Oswald, but nothing was written down. And that's normal for the times. They didn't normally tape recordings back then. I think it wasn't until later that they did. But the way that they would interrogate would be someone's asking questions in front of you. Then there's another person standing right behind you. So it's a little bit more of a forced interrogation in some aspects. He didn't really shed a lot of new light onto anything. I think there was a thing where he said that photo, it's not, it, that's my face, but that's not me in, on the backyard photographs. And then there's another one about the Ruth Payne and the Rambler situation. I mean, there's a lot of things. Absolutely. About, yeah. There's a lot of things about this case that are, are, are very, very confusing to figure out. But I consider when we talk about Dallas police helping Ruby or not really helping, but making it easy for Ruby to be able to get his shot and get his man. I mean, Ruby was allegedly calling and warning about, you know, trying someone's paying him to assassinate nate oswald and then you get into this aspect of like okay so we have the dallas police force they're really corrupt you're about to have the secret service the fbi the cia whoever investigating this person that allegedly killed the president you think they're not going to be a little bit quick to let this guy get killed only because you're about to have a bunch of people snooping around your extracurricular activities i mean everyone in this whole situation the fbi the cia i mean organized crime mafia you can blame johnson i think johnson was part of the cover-up i don't think he initially installed the assassination plan but everyone's got something dirty or some aspect and i have no idea like i mean is it a sign of pay alan dulles for instance i point when we talk about alan dulles i point to the cuba incidents i point to vietnam I point to Indonesia, where Alan Dulles owned a partially owned a gold mine over there that Kennedy was trying to disclose or get out of there. I learned that from get Greg Polgrain. So I get into this aspect. Alan Dulles has a lot of motive. Alan Dull Dulles was obviously part of the cover up. But then you have a bunch of different investigations, either the CIA, the FBI, the Dallas police force doing their own investigations as well, too. And they're all not even close to each other. And they're all skeptical of each other. So out of this whole thing to say that it's one man that killed the president and that's it, somebody's lying. And I want to know who it is. It's everybody, in my opinion. Well, I, I think you, I think, look, when I wrote this book, I, I titled the book, he was expendable, national security, political and bureaucratic cover-ups in the murder of John F. Kennedy. There were a series of cover-ups. Johnson was in on a, on a cover-up. Johnson initially was told Oswald met with KGB agents down in Mexico City. He also had information from the CIA from an informant that said he saw Oswald inside the Cuban embassy who, and receiving a large cash payment. So Johnson was concerned that basically if it came out that it was the Cubans or the Russians that killed Kennedy, we're into a thermonuclear war. 
that's your first national security cover-up right there, okay? The bureaucratic cover-ups, you know, look, personally, I think the mafia and rogue elements of the CIA killed Kennedy. That's my conclusion. I'm with you. Now, if that's the case, let's go back to the 1960s. J. Edgar Hoover is on record as stating numerous times there is no such thing as the mafia. I believe they may him. be organized. There <laughs> may be criminals, but there's no organized crime. Well, look, can you imagine it comes out that the mafia had killed John Kennedy? The FBI would look like a total house of fools. Okay, basically, you know, here's, here's Hoover telling everybody in the nation for years, there is no mafia, but yet they go and kill the president, right? So you got to cover this up. Oswald's a perfect guy. The lone wolf type of theory. He's the only guy that could have done it. Nobody else was involved. It gets the FBI off the hook. Right, right after the assassination, FBI agents were interviewing a number of mafia figures. Hoover shut it all down right away. He said, we've got our man. Focus on that. If you go back to the church committee, they soundly criticized the FBI for its failure to investigate conspiracies in the murder of President Kennedy. Well, they gave the 1035-960 document to every media outlet saying any new evidence that goes against the Warren report, you label it as a conspiracy. And at the bottom of the document, it says destroy when no longer needed. I mean, that's the most damning document I've ever seen. Oh, no, no doubt about it. So, so here you've got the FBI trying to protect its reputation. Don't forget, it never informed the Secret Service that Oswald was working in the Texas School Book Depository. They knew that. They knew he, that he had defected to Russia. They knew that he was pro-Castro. They never informed the Secret Service. Well, what about the Secret Service? How about their job? Well, what were they doing? Well, immediately after the assassination, they're out there with pails of water and brushes cleaning out the back of the presidential limousine. I know. Destroying that's so weird. all the evidence in a murder case. I know. That's so weird. And the crazy thing is, I know they have to get it back on the road and everything, but like even then, it's just like, I don't, it, dude, it gets into like, you can't buy the medical evidence manipulation aspects of things. And it's just, you're looking at it like, none of this makes sense. There's a Pruder film. You see it. The guy gets shot in the head and back into the left. But then the whole right side of his head looks like it's just gone. And then they have this picture of this perfectly intact brain. I mean, I spoke to Gary Aguilar and I spoke to David Mantic on my show and they showed no. Now we have the right records in there as well with the fake ones. But it's like this all took years to come out. This is this has been a 60 year process of just new documents being released and new information and new things. Being, and you just start looking at all the events that are going on. I mean, the Secret Service. I've talked to Vince Palomara, who's. You know, he's the expert on the Secret Service. And he even mentions nobody lost their job. And the main statement was, oh, we don't want to embarrass their their families by, you know, firing them from the force. So they were drinking the night before. It doesn't matter whether they were involved or not. There's a bunch of things that are easy mistakes that you are fired immediately on the spot if something like that happens. And in this case, it resulted in Kennedy's death. Well, the, the other thing, not only were they out drinking at that time, but they also destroyed all that evidence in the Chicago motorcade. What? There was, there was, there was a, a, a motorcade in Chicago. Let me go back. This is a kind of an interesting point, but I just want to finish very quickly. Yes. So you got the Secret Service, you got the bureaucracy covering up, Secret Service, you've got the FBI covering up, and CIA... To me, the CIA had guilty knowledge. If rogue elements of the CIA, CIA were involved, I think there were people in the CIA who knew who they were. Did you see Jim? So they had guilty knowledge. Did you see Jim DiUgino's new film, Destiny Betrayed, the four-hour version or the two-hour version? 
I, I didn't see that, by, by the way. No, I didn't. Um, I've, I've seen it so many times. It's a very good film. But one thing he shows in the film is the reenactments of the shooting shots of the investigations. What they had was they had the CIA's investigation of how it happened, the FBI's investigation and how it happened, and then one other investigation. The closest one that talked about two shooters was the CIA, where they talked about a front shot from the front right. That the CIA was the closest. The FBI was saying that here's the bullet trajectory, the three bullets, the one that hit James Tag. Right. They did it kind of like the official story, but then the CIA was like, there's a shooter from the front, and the shooter from the front was from the front right. And it, it and they showed the trajectory of the bullets. And it's like, I don't know. They were the most accurate out of the three, where you were just like, all right, they were using real knowledge on maybe a, where it actually how it went down and i go if you're the cia you don't want to you don't want to be involved in the plot you're the one orchestrating it you don't want to be anywhere near there that's why i say johnson's not i don't think he orchestrated the plot i think he covered it up but the reason why i say that is you wouldn't sit your car two cars behind kennedy because that aspect of the james take bullet that's stray bullet if you have people shooting you're not going to endanger your family or you know your wife whatever and People go, well, he was in a closed top. Kennedy was in an open. Vince told me when he was on my show, people thought that that was bulletproof, the bubble top. It wasn't. It might have no, slowed down a bullet, but the public thought it was a bubble top or it was bulletproof. So then you get into this aspect, Hoover or not Hoover, um, Johnson definitely knew it wasn't bulletproof. So you're not going to orchestrate a plot to kill Kennedy and sit right behind him when it happens. But he damn straight found out about it later. Yep. Well, I also think you got to go just to, to finish up on the cover up part. You have a political cover up as well. Johnson's got a presidential can campaign coming up in 1964. He's got scandals at all. 64. Let's get that Warren Commission done. Let's get that report out of the way. I don't want this hanging around. And then you've got Robert Kennedy. Now, Robert Kennedy is a is is somewhat strange here in that. He never took any interest in the activities of the Warren Commission while they were operating. And basically, from what I've been able to learn, he, he never bought, bought into the conclusions of the Warren Commission. But one of the first things that Robert Kennedy did was he's trying to protect his brother's legacy. So what does he do? He goes to the White House. And he immediately takes the usher's logs. Now, the White House usher, usher is the person who brings everybody into the White House that's going to see the president. Everything's written down in the book. Who came in, when they came in, when they left. Well, Kennedy was seeing a lot of people that probably his brother wouldn't have wanted the public to know about. A lot of women coming in to see him. Those usher's logs are gone. Nobody's ever seen them again. Disappeared. Robert Kennedy went and got them. Robert Kennedy also basically, although he talked about he'd have to wait until the presidential election, you know, later on, if he would have become president to reopen the investigation, also was more concerned about the fact that the CIA and the mafia were attempting to kill Kennedy. Uh, I should say uh, Fidel Castro. And I think they were trying to cover up these attempts by the CIA and the mafia to kill Castro. They wanted to keep that hidden. So he was really concerned about that as well. So Kennedy engaged, Robert Kennedy engaged in his own cover up. And part of that is where is the president's brain? Nobody knows. Gone. Where were the tissue slides? If I had a genie, if I had a genie with three wishes, that would be one of my wishes. Yeah. And then where is the Harper fragment? The portion of the president's head that was found in Dealey Plaza. That's gone. So basically, it appears that Robert Kennedy had access to all of this stuff and may have had it destroyed. You know, the key thing is this. This is evidence in a murder case. How did he have that evidence? That, that's a, a major legal question, how he was even able to obtain and hold and manipulate this evidence is a travesty. And, and 
actually contributes to all of the, the questions that we have and why we really can't get the answers that we want. So it's really a major problem. But so in other words, what you've got is you've got political cover-ups, bureaucratic cover-ups, national security cover-ups, and they create this fog. And that's what people have been dealing with for the last 60, 70 years and trying to figure out what happened on November 22nd. You've, and we just don't have the information. You've briefly, um, you, well, you've mentioned in depth a couple of things about the Warren Commission, but how did you bounce off what was a lie in the Warren Commission? I mean, was it, is there 800 pages different from the 26 volumes? I mean, I know Al, Alan Dulles's quote is that just print it all, the public doesn't read anyway. But I mean, even the House Select Committee on Assassinations, I've shown on air before with Gerald Posner, who believes that it was Oswald that did it, I showed him that the Warren Commission states that they said Marina identified his rifle. Well, the House Select Committee on Assassinations in Volume 2 proved that Marina didn't know the difference between a rifle and a shotgun, and she couldn't identify it back then, so it would be no use to the court to try and get her to identify it now. And also the fact of Oswald practicing on his back porch. The relationship between Marina Oswald or Marina and Oswald were it was the most dysfunctional relationship where she goes, I didn't know what he was doing. Whenever he pulled out his rifle, I just walked away. I never even thought to listen into any sounds or anything. So she couldn't make a statement to the House Select Committee on Assassinations when they had her in court talking about it. So that's a clear lie again from the Warren Commission. Well, let me let me tell you, you, you ask a very good question there. When you ask, how do you determine that they were covering up, the Warren Commission was covering up in its report? The problem is, when you look at the statements that they made, and then you go into the 26 volumes, the information in the 26 volumes impeaches the conclusions that they made in their written report. And let me give you one quick example. In the medical evidence, there's a major debate about CE399 and where it was found. So you have this fellow, Daryl Tomlinson, who worked at Parkland Memorial Hospital, who claims that he moved a stretcher off the elevator and placed it in the hallway. And later on, another stretcher was placed in the hallway blocking the door. And when he banged that other stretcher, a bullet rolled off, CE399. The stretcher that he took off the elevator was the one that was used by Governor Connolly. The stretcher he said that the bullet came off of had bloody towels on it. And a stethoscope. A stethoscope. Ah. And other materials on it, okay? Now, if you go through, I went through the testimony of every nurse, every orderly who handled Governor Connolly's stretcher. Every one of them said the stretcher had nothing more on it than a white sheet when it was placed in the elevator. Nothing on it except the white sheet. Daryl Tomlinson, when he took it off, the elevator said the stretcher he took off had nothing on it but a white sheet. And he said the bullet came off another stretcher in the hallway that had bloody towels on it, a stethoscope, some gloves, and other medical supplies. Now, the FBI agent, a fellow by the name of Johnson, with a it's J O H S E N. When he took the the bullet from uh, Tomlinson, he looked at that stretcher and he said, "Yeah, the stretcher had bloody towels on it, stethoscope, and other medical paraphernalia on it." Well, there was nothing on Connolly's stretcher. So where did the stretcher with the bloody towels? come from? Well, it turns out that basically uh, a young boy was admitted to the hospital right after Kennedy and Johnson. 
about a two or three year old boy. He had a bad cut in his head and he was treated. That was the stretcher that was used. That's where the bloody towels came from. And the nurse who treated him said, yeah, I left my stethoscope on there. Josiah Thompson even interviewed her and she said, yeah, I left the stethoscope on there and the bloody towels were on there. CE-399 came from that stretcher? Did somebody plant that? A hundred percent they did, man. That, 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 you see, so even if, even if we can't answer whether they planted it, okay, because we don't have the info, the problem is if you read the Warren Commission report, they deal with the stretcher and the bullet problem in two short paragraphs. It fell off this stretcher where Governor Connolly was on. Go back and read all the testimony in the 26 volumes. No way that bullet came from Governor Connolly's stretcher. So when you go through, you're going to find instance after instance where what the Warren Commission said in the report is not borne out by what you read in the 26 volumes. One of the things they state, look, Tippett and Oswald never knew one another. Really? Go in and read the testimony of the two waitresses in the Dobbs House Cafe who testified Tippett's, Tippett and Oswald were seated in the restaurant two days before the assassination having breakfast. They're right in the same restaurant, right at the counter, having breakfast. So these guys obviously came across one another at various times. There's just no doubt. So as you go through the report consistently, time after time, no, you know, like I mentioned to you in the very beginning, no credible evidence of a shot anywhere else other than the Texas School Book Depository. Go through the 26 volumes. Those totally impeached the entire Warren Commission report. The other one that, that even that only rips it even further is the acoustical evidence developed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I, I had Donald Thomas on here talk about the acoustical evidence. Um, I, I've heard by other many other researchers that it's been debunked. I don't buy it. It was something I had to look into. I mean, the act of a audio recording. I think the House Select Committee, like the way that they designed it with all these microphones and stuff, I think that makes sense. And especially countering in all the echoes and everything as well, too. But largely from the research community, I've heard the acoustical evidence kind of be rejected. Um, in my opinion, whether it's true or not, if you're fighting the side of the acoustical evidence, you're on the side that there was more than one shooter. Like there's a lot of things where the cons I don't know, you're probably very into the JFK community. You realize how divisive it is and how kind of. People oh, yeah, absolutely. It's insane. But there's the more than one shooter group. But then there's individual details where people tend to fight. On no, it's not this. It's like you ever listen to a podcast with some of these mafia guys like Sammy the Bull, hearing him talk about like, oh, Tony, he never hung out at that bar. He never got pasta for Zool. And you're like, what does this have to do with the murder that you guys were talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's, right. That's the Kennedy case. There's a bunch of people that agree Oswald or he was innocent or he was guilty, but even the lone nutters fight amongst each other. Even the conspiracy people fight amongst each other over really small details where I go, it's just about getting the new generations like myself and younger and people interested into the case. And the whole idea of that is if you do not believe the official story, you can, I mean, the overall fact is the Warren commission is what the history books are written on. They don't take account for the work. The assassination records review board does the new documents that we have or the house select committee on assassinations. How do we, make it to where the people can understand this is what needs to be taught the later investigations not the original one that was very very good at covering up a lot of issues well i agree with you and i think i think if, going back to the acoustical evidence and i want to spend a moment on this to, to, to talk about this one of the things that we we heard from the national research council was that there were no gunshots on that tape. They were random noise. Now, the interesting thing about the National Research Council is that these are scientists. Now, it's like you came up to me today and you said, you know, uh, I just heard a jet plane fly over. 
And I said to you, or, I, or you actually said to me, I just filmed a jet plane flying over. And I said, no, 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 that wasn't a jet plane. It was random noise. I don't have to prove anything. I just blew your theory out of the water. I'm just simply saying, no, 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 it was random noise. Real scientists would prove what was on that tape was random noise, and they would identify the type of random noise that it was. They never even attempted to do that. To this day, they can't explain what that random noise is. Let me go to another one. They never, you know, the, the shots that were recorded, they, the, uh, the people who did the analysis at BBN used the sound waves, not, not the sound waves, the echo patterns is what they used to arrive at their results. The National Research Council never explained how random noise could mimic the echo patterns of shots actually recorded in Dealey Plaza, because that's what the House Select Committee on Assassinations did. They put the microphones out, fired weapons from the Banlika Kakanos from the Texas School Book Depository, and used a pistol on the knoll. They recorded the echo patterns. How could the echo patterns from shots recorded in Dealey Plaza match random noise? The National Research Council never explained that. They walked away from it. They didn't offer any explanation. In other words, you can just, somebody comes out with scientific evidence and you can just simply say, oh, no, no, that's just random noise. You don't have to prove anything. That's how science works. Sorry, that's pseudoscience. So, in, so you have those two major problems as well. They never explained as an example what Bob Blakey pointed out to me. He said, uh, you know, they focused on the shot from the uh, knoll. That, the, that that was completely uh, random noise. But Blakey says you can't have it both ways because the analysis done by both Baranek and Newman, you know what else it showed? Three shots from the book depository. So if the shot from the knoll is no good, then the shots in the book depository have to be no good. And you have no proof that there were three shots from the Texas School Book Depository. Okay, so he also made that point. And then there's an, another interesting aspect to this. Not only did they design this experiment very well, but they did experimentation to make sure that their results were correct. So one of the first thing that they wanted to, to check out was whether gunshots would be picked up on a tape at the, at the amplitude level that were on the tape that they had. So what did they do? They went to the Massachusetts police and they got a motorcycle. They asked the Massachusetts police to fire shots recorded on their motorcycle and see if the amplitude was the same as what they had on the tape. They matched. So basically, the motorcycle could pick up the gunshots. They proved that. Then as an example, another example of experimentation, they went and they noticed that on one of the shots, the echo patterns were diminished. And then they realized that the motorcycle had a windshield. And they said, did the windshield cause the diminishment in the recording of these uh, echo patterns. So they went to the New York City Police Department and they asked the NYPD to test this theory. So the NYPD fired shots while the motorcycle was had its windshield facing the shots, away from the shots and so on. They recorded the shots. What did they find? When that windshield was facing the shots, they got the same level of diminishment. So all of those things indicate this is good data. 
Now, the other very interesting thing about it is, keep in mind, they place the microphones in three places where the earliest possible shot was, where Kennedy may have been hit in the back and where he may have been hit in the head. The microphones were placed at those locations. Those microphones picked up unique sounds at each location. They would have unique Edo echo patterns. And what was so unbelievable was that the analysis that they did showed that the first shot that was done in Dealey Plaza matched the exact location of where that shot would have taken place. So in other words, as they went down the line to the microphones, the different microphones, microphone number one, we'll just call it number one, picked up the shot as shown when the shot, when the motorcade was at the number one position. All of the microphones recorded everything exactly in order. In other words, the shots weren't out of order. So in other words, there was tremendous order in the data. And when you get that, you've got very useful data, very conclusive data. And that all supports the findings of the acoustic evidence by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Also, one of the jobs of scientists is to be able to explain and predict. Did their data allow them to make predictions? Yeah. They said the motorcade was moving at 11 miles per hour. That's what the Zapruder film shows. It also showed that the speaker that picked up the sounds in Dealey Plaza, the gunshots, was on the left-hand side of the motorcycle. That's exactly where that speaker was, the left-hand side of the motorcycle. They also said the windshield is going to interfere with the echo patterns. Did that occur? Absolutely. So you've got good data here. The conclusions are solid. And as an example, if you, you talk about you interviewed Mr. Thomas, Dr. Thomas. Thomas said the House Select Committee, the BBN, I should say, made one mistake. They said their, they said their error was less than 5%. Thomas said their error was even less than that. There was only a chance of one out of 100,000, one out of 100,000 that the information that was picked up on that dicta belt was random noise. The error was extremely small. That was the only mistake they made. I got to tell you, I went through the acoustic evidence in great detail, and I also went through it in great detail in the book. There's no doubt it's solid. Well, um, I just got one last question for you. Uh, when it comes to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, do you think they would have ended up solving who killed Kennedy or what happened if their funds didn't dry up? Well, the funds are not the only problem that they had. You had to keep in mind there was also a lot of political interference as well. And you know, one of the things that Blakey, you know, a lot of people blame Blakey, Bob Blakey, for how this turned out. But he did bring in a conclusion of uh, that there was a conspiracy to kill the president. I'm not sure that they would have found it. I don't think they would have gotten the documents. I don't think they, the CIA was, was, was covering everything up. I mean, even the liaison that um, was handling this thing. Uh, with, with Blakey was lying to Blakey. Blakey found this out years later. And uh, I'm not sure that we'll ever get to these documents. I think that, you know, Bob Blakey said to me one time, if you think you're going to find documents among the missing documents that will show that the CIA had a hand in this, you can forget about it. Those documents are long gone. A lot of evidence has been destroyed. And I think it was destroyed even even long before the House Select Committee on Assassinations met. It's called right after it's printed, they destroyed it. Yeah, I, th I think we're left with, with, with inadequate investigations. We don't have all the data. And the best that we can do 
is to take the data that we have, the data points that we have, and construct a workable hypothesis. That's the best we can do. Well, James, I appreciate the time you've given me to talk about this topic. Um, it means a lot. And especially, um, could, do you have a place where people can find your links? Do you have a Twitter handle? Do you have a website? Do you have any books? Yeah, I have a website. And the website is the John F. Kennedy Political Science Assassination Study. So if you go on to Yahoo, you can you can go on to this real easy. Or go Google. John F. Kennedy Political Science assassination study and i've posted uh, a couple of papers several papers on there and i've got uh, conversations with bob blakey on there and bob blakey at one point in time asked me to um is he still alive the... yeah he still is yeah he's i gotta get him helpful, on the show the i gotta get him on the show yeah he, he's very helpful he would he would I'll, I'll i'll give him a call and talk to him about maybe doing it with you uh but one of the things that bob blakey said um you know, one of the things he asked me to do was to send a copy to Bert Griffin, who was one of the Warren Commission uh, attorneys. And Griffin is a judge. And I sent him a copy of the book. And uh, Griffin wound up sending me a set of what you, the only thing you could call it was interrogatories. In other words, he sent me a list of questions that I had to answer, which I did. And I posted all those answers online. So if anybody, is interested in, um, you know, uh, Griffin's um, uh, differences with, with my conclusions, you'll see my answers to him and why I came to those conclusions. It's in detail. Well, I'm going to link your links in the description. Um, is there Amazon links for your books as well, too? I'll link in. Yeah, it's all, the book is on Amazon. It's on, uh, it's on. Did you want to show it up real quick to people listening and watching? Sure. Can you, can you see it? Yep. He was expendable. It's a very shiny. And the reason cover. I came to that, the reason I came to the conclusion he was expendable was you had to protect the bureaucracy. Politicians had to protect their careers and their legacies and national security. One man was a small price to pay to protect all that. This is not me rubbing my fingers together to mean the sound of the world's smallest violin. This is a money aspect. There's that. There's a little bit of that uh, sprinkled in there. But um, I'm going to link all your links in the description. James, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.